Carful, but it's Mitch Wiggins. Carful was one of our buddies in college. Uh, we have known Mitch uh, for, for many years. His dad was the director uh, out at uh, Camp Blue Haven, and so we got to know him, went to church together with him when April and I lived in Canyon. And uh, so Mitch is preaching down at uh, Western Heights in Sherman. Been down there for five, or six, ten, I mean six years or so. Uh, things are going great down there. I keep up with them on Facebook. And uh, Mitch has been here three or four years now, and everybody loves him. And looking forward to, to your lesson tonight. So, Mitch. This is my fourth year here now, and uh, I was uh, talking to a couple people about, as I was already chastised for not having stickers this year, and I'm like, I think that was four years ago. <laughs> but uh, the problem is, I set the bar too high, and I don't remember what the world I said besides I brought stickers. And you may be the same same thing there. So, I'm all right. I, I have a lifelong goal to be known as the candy man, um, and so I'm working on that right now. I've got a, a few more years to get there. I am uber excited actually to come tonight though because I've been in conversation with Lane about uh, y'all and, and the merge and the move and the things like that and I have been like so excited to be able to come here and be a part to see this for myself because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of what y'all are giving us a picture of because in a world that is so divided and in a church context that is so divided, you are showing a piece of the gospel of unity. And it, believe me, people are noticing. Not just here, um, but I, we, we have talked about it in uh, ministers things that there in Sherman, and other people from our community have talked about it. So your reach, and just by a, a simple show of unity, I say simple, there's a whole lot more complexity uh, in unity, but just what you're doing is uh, is having ripple effects, and I thank you so much for that example. This evening we're going to continue uh, your summer series, One People Under God, uh, specifically the subject that I was given, as you can see on the screen, created by God, and uh, it's really launching point, it's really simple. Created by God, well, let's head to the beginning of Scripture. Let's head to the very first place where we are introduced to God. In our Bibles, Genesis 1 1, we see in the beginning God created. One of the first things that we learn not only is there a God and there was a beginning to things, but God is a creator. And in fact, we can we can extrapolate this, we can we can pull this out and say, well, what all did God create? We can sum it up pretty easily. Everything. We might even be able to say, well, hold on, Mitch. Pretty sure, well, y'all are y'all are in a building project, or soon to be, right? This is stuff that you're gonna create, right? You're gonna build. You have an architect, you have an engineer, you have different people that are gonna do the different things. But make no mistake, every one of those people is using materials that God created. And so God still is the creator, and he empowers with un in us the ability to be like him. We're, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's talk about what is happening here. We learn God created. Six days of creation. I know there's seven, and seven was the day of rest. Six is when we did the work. Six days of creation, everything is created. He ends most every day by saying, and it was good. All right, don't know this. I'm glad I'm not having to repeat the story to you. Again, it was great. Six day. Slightly different. God ends it by saying, and it was very good. So something happened in the sixth day that was different than the fifth day, fourth day, third day, second day, and even first day. And we're going to talk about what that is, and I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with you. But you know the story, but let's look at it anyway. Genesis 1, 26 and following, it said, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And God said, look. I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given you every green plant as food, all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Every plant has life. And that's what happened. That God looked over all that he had made. And he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. So there's a lot of things we could talk about in there. A lot of uh, wonderful points that are being brought up. We're just going to focus on a few. God created more than just animals on the sixth day. The animals are encompassed in this. But he created more than just animals. He created a very purposeful animal called a human. And we are slightly different than the rest of the animals. Some people, we question that. Um, they're a little bit more of a link. Uh, that we might give credit for, but we're separate from the rest of creation. And there's a few reasons as to why, uh, what it might look like. One of the first that, that I want, want you to look at is that's different is humans are given dominion over the rest of creation. God says, I have created you. You are part of creation, but I have created you to be slightly different than everything else I've created. You are given dominion. And scripture honors this dominion in other places. We can even look at Psalm 8, uh, 5 through 6. By the way, uh, the passages up on the screen are from the New Living Translation. I usually try to put that up there and I forgot this time. But uh, that's where that's coming from. If you're looking at your NIV or your King James, you're going to notice some differences. Uh, that's where I'm at. Psalm 8, 5 says, You made humans only a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims the ocean's currents. Now, different translations say you made us a little lower than the angels. Both of those translations are pretty high honor, no matter how you slice it. Pretty high honor. We're made just a little lower than these divine, either the divine or the divine beings. And wow. And glory and honor are ascribed to humans because of our relationship to the rest of creation. You know what I'm We are created to have dominion over the rest of creation. And this is glory and honor. So what does this mean? What does this look like? It means that God has given us a privilege. God has created us for a purpose. And it's not just to live. It's not just to breathe air and survive and then one day we will die. God created us with a purpose to take care of his creation. Or maybe another way to put this, God has given us a purpose to take care of and even study his creation. This to me is where science fits in. Science is not opposed to God. Who do you think created science? Who do you think created the curiosity that would lead to people looking at different rocks or looking at different things and saying, hey, wait, there might be a design to this. There might be something going on. Science fits into God's plan because he created us with a curiosity that would embark us on a journey of discovery of God's creation. I love this. You have purpose. Most every one of our jobs will fit into this understanding. In fact, the case can be made, every one of our jobs will fit into this understanding. We are in charge of creation. We have the ability to cut down trees. We do. We have the ability to breed animals, to domesticate them, or really whatever. We have authority here. God has given us, created us to have authority here. And so part of what dominion means is that uh, we can use creation to bless our lives. Part of what it means. But it does not mean that we can ravage creation, pollute it, destroy it for our own selfishness. Although we are given dominion, 
Creation is still owned by God. And there's a difference. We are still part of creation. We are still created by God as everything else is. But we have been given a special place in creation to have dominion over the rest of it. But we need to remember, it ain't ours. Now that's the first piece of why uh, we're set apart. The second is I think much deeper. The second piece is we are created in the image of God. Did you notice that in verse 26 and 27? He created them in the image of God. They were created male and female. They're created. In other words, humans are created just a little bit different than the rest of creation. If you look over at chapter 2, in chapter 2, it's almost a, it's a different retelling of creation. It's almost like, a all right, we tell the story of the seven days. And then now we're going to focus in a little bit closer on the creation of a garden and the creation of man and then woman to really tell the story a little bit stronger. But in chapter 2, verse 7, we see, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and man became a living person. And then just a little bit later, we can, we can see that God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so out of the rib of man... He fashioned woman and breathed life into her. When God created humans, this is always humbling to me. I grew up on a farm. I was on a farm out in the Oklahoma Panhandle. And if you know anything about that neck of the woods, um, we had no woods, so we were just the neck. And uh, we had a lot of dirt that would come through. And I loved dirt because my dad was a farmer. I had no problem with this. But I also knew that dirt, well, there's a saying, you know, it's not worth dirt. Uh, that type of idea that it's not worth much. It isn't. Dirt of dust is considered the lowest thing of creation. God reaches down and picks up the lowest thing of creation and then blesses it with the most glorious thing ever. His breath. And from that humble and divine here you are. This is a beautiful little picture going on here. There's an aspect that this is what makes us special. This is what makes us unique uh, compared to all the rest of creation. But there's an aspect in which every one of us needs to recognize this is what makes you specifically unique and beautiful in creation. Because I believe the created, creation story in Genesis 1 and 2, telling the dust of the ground and then, and then breathing life into it, isn't just a story about how Adam was created, but the care and the beautifulness. Lane, is that a word? Okay. I should ask Amy. She's probably better at defining your, your words. That right there is still happening. I believe that is because of Psalm 139, 13 and 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know full well. Now, if you want to analyze the psalmist here, you can think, wow, he's pretty arrogant. Notice what he says. You created me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And then he says, and all your works are wonderful. Catch what he's saying? We have a whole lot of people that have self-esteem issues in our world. The psalmist doesn't seem to struggle with self-esteem. You know what he's, he notices? It's not about me. But I am beautiful. I am wonderful. And if for no other reason, it's because I am created by God. That is a message that every one of our kids need to hear. That is a message that every one of us needs to hear. That you are beautiful. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. True specialness of, as humans is not so much our uniqueness towards one another, but it's our uniqueness of creation. We are created in the image of God. Now, I'm going to dive in a little bit further about what that means. Because a lot of times we hear that, we're like, oh, image of God. 
Sounds good. What in the world does that mean? Well, if we are created by God and, and we have this image of God, it's going to mean several things into our lives. So first is our being, if we're created in the image of God, our being is in some sense the same as God. That was back in verse 26 of uh, Genesis 1. It says, let us make man, humankind, in our own image. First off, uh, I always love seeing uh, the places where God uh, speaks to himself. Uh, that way I, I know whenever I speak to myself, it's scriptural. God did it before me. It's all good. But also, I love that it shows something pretty amazing from the very beginning. It shows Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. There's a lot of I'm trying to figure out. Scholars will debate exactly what's happening here. But I'm, I stand on pretty uh, solely ground to say God is talking to himself. He's talking to himself, the Son, and himself, the Holy Spirit here. Saying, let us, fullness of God, make humans in the image of the fullness of God. In other words, there is an aspect in which the Trinity is in each of you. A lot of times we talk about this simply on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We talk about this when we, we, uh, we teach and, and preach or participate in a baptism. We might say, hey, now you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But there's also passages that says that Christ dwells in you. And there's also passages about God living in us, that we are His temple. In other words, Scripture is pointing to the realization that there is something about you that promises a piece of the trend. Not the fullness, but at least a piece and understanding. Part of this, it might be talked about in, in, in our understanding of our consciousness or our, our minds. You realize no other creature has a mind like humans, right? You ever thought about that? Here's the fun part. They haven't. They have not thought about their uniqueness. Because you can't. They can't. Maybe we can understand this not just in our ability of mind and conscience, but our moral qualities, our, our, our ability to understand and think through moral understandings. That we can choose between right and wrong. Nothing else in all creation has that ability to choose between right and wrong. Now you may want to quibble with me on that and say, well, my dog, I've trained them to do what's right. No, no reality, you have trained them to choose within their best interests. I don't think a dog cares what's right or wrong. They want to please you. And to them, that's good enough, but that's not moral. Simply pleasing someone else is not moral. As humans, no matter our religion, no matter our upbringing, we ask ourselves, is this right or is this wrong? To some standard that Christianity, I'm pretty sure, has the best answer for. But other groups are saying, hey, what is this? What is this standard? We can ask that question because we are created by God. Let me clarify, I'm not just pretty sure Christianity has the best answer. I'm, I know Christianity has the best answer on this, but uh, I realize that didn't come out right, so I apologize. <laughs> Another way that we can understand this, uh, this image of God and is some, is some sense of the same God in us. Another way that we can look at that is just our eternal life. I mean, just the fact that what we do here now, together, matters for eternity. Just the mere fact that we can even talk about that possibility shows that we are more than just flesh and blood. We are something more, that God created us as something more. Something's going to last forever. Now, I don't have the answer of what exactly that means. There's uh, some scriptures that point to different things and what that might look like, but I'm going to be honest, scripture's still pretty vague. I mean, scripture will even say, who has gone to the depths? And who can go to the heights and counsel God? Here's the thing, I'm going to wait and see. I'm kind of excited. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be awed at what God does, the eternal part of me. Because I'm coming to the age. I know you're looking at me like, man, that guy's young. I am. But I'm starting to realize that I'm not as invincible as I once was. 
and I'm coming to the age where I'm waking up sore for no good reason. I just slept. What is that? It's get, it's, it gets better, right? No? Okay. Great. Thanks, guys. Thing is, this body, I know it can't last forever. But there's something in me that's been created to be eternal as God. Now, not me being God, but like God in his likeness. And so first that we understand the image of God is our being is in some sense the same as God's. But maybe there's another way to understand that. The Imago Dei, the image of God, gives us uh, this understanding that we are God's representatives here on this earth. We understand this idea of being a representative for someone else. We may even talk about it in the term of an ambassador. That relates to the image of God in this way. Up to the, the point of the story, if we look at uh, if we look at creation, God created everything, and it's all under His command, all under His rule. But then He creates human beings and gives them the authority to rule and create. So He creates them to do a job that He was already doing. That may sound strange. It may sound weird, unless we look at it maybe in some, another context. So if a king were to go and conquer another land. They expand their territory. What they typically do in, in that um, idea is they will set up a trusted governor to now rule this new land by their authority. And so now there is a ruler that can make decisions, that can change things, that can work not on his own authority, but because he's an ambassador of the king. Or in our modern context, we even have this in our own government. That we will have ambassadors that will, by the authority of the government, president or however that fully works. Again, I'm not a politician, so I don't fully know how a lot of our government works. If one of you can explain to me how our government works, then we might be even better. You know, that's great. But the thing is, there's an ambassador. The ambassador has authority, but it's not their own. It is something that was given to them. From the one who has it. So there's a represent, uh, we are representatives of the one true king. Maybe another way to understand this is the same king conquers the land, and instead of setting up simply an ambassador, he says, you know what? I want to make sure everyone remembers who I am. And so they set up an image of themselves. We see this several places in scripture where different kings would set up an image of themselves, but we also see in our own culture where we set up an image on our money make a point. We set up an image of who we are. God, when he created the heavens and the earth, when he created everything, his prized creation was you. And how you know that was he gave you his image to be an ambassador, to be the one in charge, to have dominion, and to be the one that reflects the image you were given. So that leads into number three. In the image of God as humans, we reveal in part who God is, what God is like. I'm not saying that we can reveal all of it. Because not one of us can fully reveal or really fully understand God. We are mere humans. We are the creation. What part of creation can say uh, to the potter, why are you making me like this? Which one of us can, can counsel God? No, that's not what we can do. But there is, in the most simplistic form, an image is a reflection of the original. Going back to the money idea. If you pull out you know, any money, like if you real, have the real stuff still, it's not just some digital something, and, you know, credit cards or whatever, but you know, if you have like a real uh, dollar bill, you know, maybe a five if you're rich, I don't know. You got one of those, pull it out. You notice on one side, you probably have a building. But on the other side, which we call the front side, you have an image. You have an image, usually of some dude, some guy who did something in our country. And I don't mean to devalue that, but what I'm saying is, is it his full likeness? 
mean, I wasn't alive to see Lincoln. Maybe a couple of you were, I'm not sure. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. But here's the thing. No, it's not the full image of that max. It's a headshot. And it's not even a great one at that. But it's meant to show some characteristics. It's meant to show, like, if, if we were then, I, I'm convinced, I'm convinced, I picked on Lincoln, I'm convinced that if anyone, if any one of us who have never seen Lincoln alive, would somehow God decided through his divine providence that this was what needed to happen, and raise Lincoln from the dead, he'd walk into town, I bet you most every one of us would know exactly who he is. Why? Because you've seen his image. You've got a penny. You've got some money. You've got some things that show his likeness. Can the same be said about God? If God were to walk into your school, walk into your workplace, walk in wherever, would people go, I know exactly who that is? Because the image bearer has already shown. That's what the image of God is pointing to. Is that we reveal in some way, shape, or form what God is like. <laughs> God chooses humans to be an image of himself to the world. This is part of the reason I believe why Israel would be told um, in Exodus 20 verse 4 that you must not make yourself an idol for any kind or of, of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. And that's a pretty big deal in Exodus. Don't make for yourself any graven image, anything um, that you're trying to relate to me. The golden calf, well, this is, this is your God. The biggest reason I believe why God doesn't want that is not competition for him. This is God, I mean, there is no competition for God. He's the creator of it all. I mean, there may be competition in our hearts, but let's be honest, he's going to whoop up in the end. We know the story of Revelation. We know how that goes. I haven't gotten there yet. We were in Genesis. We all got that. We've seen Revelation, right? Whole story of Revelation. There are two sides. Choose wisely. One side wins, one side doesn't. That's the story in a nutshell. We know how this ends. A God, creator of it all, has already chosen an image. This is why you don't make golden calves. This is why you don't make images of anything else because God has already chosen an image. It's you. Now sometimes I look at the mirror and I think, man, he sure could pick a better image. And then let's be honest, some, some other days I look at, look at the mirror and I'm thinking, God, you did good. You all have those days, right? You have that roller coaster. And some days you're like, I am the image of God. And then some days you're like, I'm not sure God's near me. And God created us. Each one of us. I don't know how it works. I don't know if there's a conversation in heaven for each one of us that's saying, hey, I'm about to, I'm about to create his parents don't know him yet. But he's about to wreck their lives. If you do anything about me as a kid, you would agree. And he's about to change everything for them. I'm going to create it in such a way that they will have to never have another child after him. <laughs> I don't know how the conversation went. Uh, that's what my mom told me the conversation went like, so I don't know. But regardless, I don't know if there is what I'm, if there is a conversation. Here's my bet of what it ends with. After the discussion, after all the planning and everything, and, and God fashioning each one of us, and steps back, looks at all this, you probably have some angels like, hey, why'd you put such a big nose on that guy? A little bit of a little character, don't worry. <laughs> Why'd you do that? Just wait. And he looks at creation. He looks at you and he says, it is very good. I don't know, I'm speculating. But I know he said that about all of humanity. 
So I don't think it's a big leap to say that he said that he says it about that individual that he says, "You, my beloved creation, you are very good." See, this world has tried to sell us a different story. This world has tried to give us a story that leaves God out of the picture. This world has tried to give us a story that tells us that our image is based upon what we do and make of ourselves. It's how we dress. It's what we like and dislike. It's how we talk. It's how we fix our hair. It's the kind of makeup we put on. I don't do that part, but you know, maybe some of you do. But it's the things about our external that are our image. I don't know if uh, the people here in this aisle have noticed, but uh, I, I like socks, and I'm going to do something that Wayne has probably done every Sunday. It shows off the socks, right? All right. I got tacos on my socks. Why do I have tacos on my socks? Because someone gave me taco socks that would match a yellow shirt. That's it. But I've realized at Western Heights, people have gotten to know that I usually wear fun socks. And so I get the oddest request from people. They'll come up to me and give me a hug and say, hey, show me your socks. <laughs> that happens to you all the time, right? I don't know what's going on. I know that I'm tempted every once in a while to let that be my image. I'm the cool sock guy. I can do worse things. But I'm tempted to put so much of my being upon what cover my feet. And sometimes, that may not be socks for you. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your glasses. Maybe it's something about your facial hair or lack thereof or whatever. And you say this. This is my identity. This world struggles with identity. Do you realize that? Conversations that I'll say our kids are happy, but we've been having for a while. Now we're dressed in the, in, in the understanding of, okay, so am I male or female, or is there another option? And then we put it in so many other categories, and we say, this is my image. Go look at magazines, and you'll get this picture of what you should look like. Basically, summing up most every advertisement mm -hmm. is don't you want to look like this or be like this? <clears throat> and the thing is, we do. We buy into it. Literally buy into it sometimes. We call the number and buy the product because we want to look like and be like that person. Most famously, this is beer commercials. Not that I've ever seen one, but I hear about them, right? Okay. Kidding. I've watched TV, all right? But beer commercials, have you ever noticed there's a common thing? All the people are good looking and young. So they say what they're selling is if you drink this, enough of it, you will feel good looking and young. <laughs> I've been around all of us to know that ain't the case. But we have engrossed ourselves with this image that we have to create. That we have to somehow create this image. And the thing is, the message of Christ, the message of the Bible, is that you don't have to create your image. You have already been given. You have been created in the image of God. Your image is already given. You realize in Scripture there is no physical ideal. Like in our world, we have a physical idea. I ran across a, uh, a, a, what a survey, but it was a, a montage of pictures that showed the ideal physical traits for every state. <clears throat> I'm not going to mention what Oklahoma was. We'll just skip that, but you know. Um, every one of them, slightly different, all beautiful people. This ideal image, you know, in scripture, there's not one place that says, here's the ideal, physically. But it does have an internal image that is not more than ideal, it is perfect. That internal image is the one that was given to you. Our job 
in creation. It has already been given before you could choose it. It was given to you. The image of God is in every one of us. Our job is to not squelch it. Our job is to let it shine. And when we let the image of God shine in us, imagine what that does to how we view the rest of us. John Baptist once said, I must decrease so he can increase. I wonder what would change in my life, what would change in your life. If every morning you look in the mirror and you're not sitting there thinking, okay, how do I get all the hair straight? How do I, you know, cover up the, the wrinkles that are starting to show or, or impress the whoever that I want to impress? Instead of that, I look at myself and say, hey, you know what? You are beloved. You're created by God. He says you're very good. And there's an image in me that's of you. And Lord, let's make it shine a little bright today. Because the thing is, when God placed his image in you, he gave you the power to hide that image or to let it shine. And God wants to work with you in letting it shine. If we actually found our worth, our self-esteem, and our purpose in what God has already created in us, believe we might actually come to understand that God says, very good. He means it. I told a youth group once that God that was struggling with some image things and I said, God doesn't make junk. You are not junk. You are very good. Now we can mess that up. Don't get me wrong. We can mess up the image of God. We can put sin in our lives that taints that image, but it doesn't remove it. That image of God is in us, and it's our job to continue to reveal that, to let it reflect His glory every step of our lives. So this morning, that seems like this morning. I don't, I've had a long day. This evening, I don't know where you're at. I'm going to take a while to guess that some of you are in a place where you have been put some shade on the image of you. You've been trying to cover it up and, and, and create your own image, so I'm going to guess some of you are there. I'm going to guess others of you are struggling with your self-worth. Not that you're trying to hide or conceal anything, but you don't think you're worth much. And I hope that you realize you are a value prize creation of God. But if you need some help remembering your value, if you need some help letting his light shine in, I believe that's what the church community is for. Because we are created not simply individually in the image of God. We are created collectively to reflect God's glory together. And collectively we can't do it without each one of you shining bright. So this evening, if you need some prayers, if you need uh, some polish for that image, to you, or if you want to connect that image that you're created with, with the new creation of Christ wiping away your sins through the waters of baptism, I want you to know there's no better time than the present. Would you let it be known as we stand, as we sing? Jesus.